Greetings, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries, in John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is going to be part three of the mystery of the fig tree, but actually it's going to be on God's vineyard. So before we start that, we're going to do a little background information. Turn your Bibles to the book of Isaiah. All right, Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 1. Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my well-beloved, touching his vineyard. Well, let's take a look at vineyard. That's how they pronounce it, even though it says vine yard, V-I-N-E-Y-A-R-D. It's a yard of vines, but they pronounce it vineyard. I could never figure that out. It should be vine yard, right? But they pronounce it vineyard. And uh, grapes grow on vines. During my time in the military, when I was in southern Germany, I was in a town called, a city called Heilbronn, and it was, the countryside was surrounded by grapes, um, and I was, what, 18-year-old punk kid over in Germany, and one of the hardest decisions I had to make was when I was off duty and wandering around the German countryside was, let's see, am I going to drink German beer or am I going to drink German wine? They were both very good. German wine is excellent uh, quality. They don't sell us the good stuff over here. They keep the good stuff for themselves over there. So, but I don't drink. I hardly ever drink. Um, I will admit at uh, Passover, I have been known to drink a few sips of uh, wine. But that's what a vineyard is. It's talking about grapes. Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my well-beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it. Why did he fence it? Well, you put a fence up to keep out the animals. And... There was a, there's a verse in the book of Job where, uh, if you read Job 1, chapter 1, Satan says, ah, oh, you've put a hedge around Job. And he challenged God to a duel, so to speak, and says, let me, let me persecute Job and he will curse you to your face, God. You know, so Satan said, yeah, you put a hedge about him. Well, what's a hedge? It's just a basically a fence of living plants. But God, God put a hedge up so that Satan couldn't touch him. He protected him. God protects all his true believers. You want to know why there are starving children in Africa and India? Because they don't ask the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob for their daily bread. They don't. So, you know, if a if somebody's praying to the devil, whether they know they are or ignorantly, out of ignorance, it matters not to the Lord. You're not you're not blessing him, you're not praising him, you're not asking him. If you pray to the devil, you think God's going to answer you with a blessing? No, that gives uh, that gives glory to the devil. That ain't going to happen. In India, every single day on average, about 3,000 people starve to death. And yet they export rice. When you go to the grocery, look at basmati rice, B-A-S-M-A-T-I, I believe. It says product of India. They export rice. And they let their people starve. Wonderful. 
God's vineyard, and he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it. Well, what's a tower good for? Well, when you build a tower, uh, for example, back in the uh, days of when they built castles, a tower was so you could go to the top and see trouble coming from far away. And towers were a very good defensive position. If, if an army came against a tower, the tower could shoot arrows down. And if you try to shoot an arrow up to a, a, a tower, if the tower's high enough, uh, sometimes the, the, the arrow couldn't even get up that high. So, you know, a tower was a very, very good defensive position uh, back in the old days. And he fenced it, God's vineyard, and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, fruit, and it brought forth wild grapes. Now, there's a difference between domesticated and wild fruit. A lot of times wild fruit is just, uh, just doesn't, you know, it doesn't taste good. There's a thing called field corn, and that's what they feed to the hogs. And then there's sweet corn, which is what we eat. One time I made the mistake of trying to eat field corn, and it tastes terrible. And no, they, they it's not genetically modified. It's just that they uh, would take, if you had corn that tasted good, you'd breed it with other corn that tasted good to get the characteristics that you want. It's, it wasn't genetically modified. I mean, field corn's been around forever. But that's the difference. You got sweet grapes, and then you got wild grapes. Well, wild grapes could be bitter tasting. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. Aren't a lot of people wild in their youth, ungodly? I know I was. I still got a lot of work, but compared to what I was as a teen and early in my 20s, oh boy. Verse 3, And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, pray. I'm sorry, and men of Judah, judge. Judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. I want you to, you know, people of Jerusalem and, and men of Judah, I want you to judge. And I pray you between me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes brought it forth wild grapes. And now, go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up. See, when you take away the fence and the hedge, the wild animals come in and devour. You know, if you if you got a bunch of crops, the deer will come in, the, you know, all the animals will come in. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. And I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned. Do you know why people prune trees? Well, when you got a branch that doesn't quite produce what it used to, you prune it, you cut it, you cut it back. So instead of having one big branch that doesn't produce anything, now you got two branches that do produce. That's why uh, gardeners prune. 
lot of you city slickers don't know this stuff. Not that I'm a farm boy. I'm not. So, God's saying, I did everything that I could for my vineyard. And it didn't produce what I wanted it to produce. So here it is. Verse 6. And I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned nor digged. But there shall come up briars and thorns. Let's take a break real quick. All right, let's, uh, sorry about that. I forgot to pause the thing while I was looking. All right, so in Genesis chapter 3, when God pronounced the curse upon Adam and Eve for disobedience, let's take a look at verse 17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. So, verse 18. Thorns also, and thistles, shall it bring forth to thee. And thou shalt eat the herb of the field. You know what happens when you got thorns? growing up, well, when you start working in them, with them, you're going to get stuck. You're going to bleed. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So that's the name of that tune. All right, back to Isaiah 5. God said in verse 6, And I will lay it waste, it shall not be pruned nor dig, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. Listen carefully. The Lord's going to interpret his word. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. Did you catch that? For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression. For righteousness, but behold, a cry. God's vineyard is the house of Israel. Twelve tribes. And the men of Judah, one of the twelve tribes, his pleasant plant. God looked for judgment, but instead he found oppression. God looked for righteousness, but instead people crying. Verse 8. Woe unto them that join house to house. I always thought about apartments when I read this verse. Woe unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field, till there be no place that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. You see, Israel was supposed to dwell alone. 
in the midst of the earth. God separated the children of Adam. Separated them. I mean, did God make a mistake when he put the Negroes in Africa, Central Africa? Did he make a mistake when he put the Asians in Asia, the Japanese in Japan, the Chinese in China, and he put the whites in Europe? In Europe? Did he make a mistake? I mean, after all, if, if he wanted us all together and all the same, which is what the world is doing now, he'd have done it in the first place, wouldn't he have? And if you want to know the right side of a Bible issue, look at what the world is doing and do the opposite. If the world says, oh, we're just one big human family, let's mix everybody together, black, white, red, and yellow, uh, all are precious in his sight, you know, red, yellow, black, and white, all are precious in his sight. That's what the world says. Are they? I mean, God doesn't hate anybody because of their color of their skin. I mean, didn't he create everything? But he didn't put us all together. He separated us for a reason. And I don't claim to know all the reasons. I don't. Woe unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field, till there be no place that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. All right, let's go take a look. Genesis chapter 17. So the Bible says that Israel is God's vineyard. Well, let's find out who Israel is. Now, if you're not sure, and I'm just going to briefly touch on this, you could take a look at my playlist. I have an entire playlist on God's covenant promises to Abraham. An entire playlist. Genesis chapter 17. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant. That's a promise. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. And there's people that are going to try to tell you that that little country in the Middle East is all that remains of Abraham. God said he would make Abraham, the father of many nations. And they want to tell you that one little tiny nation is the fulfillment of this prophecy. I don't think so. I think I believe the Bible more than I believe anything. I believe it was Mark Twain. It was some famous person. They said, I don't believe the Bible. And they said, well, why not? They said, because... God made this promise to Abraham to be the father of many nations. Where are they? Well, maybe you're looking in the wrong place for the fulfillment of God's prophecy. And thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful. And I will make nations of thee. And kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee and their generations for an everlasting covenant. To be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed, or children, 
and to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant. Therefore thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. So, let's stop right there. All right, let's skip down to verse 15. Uh, God gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision, but God doesn't want us to have the circumcision of the flesh. He wants us to have the circumcision of the heart. And he doesn't want us to have the law written on tablets of stone. He wants us to have the law written in the tablets of our heart. So, you know, I, uh, all right, let's go to verse 15. That's, and God said unto Abraham, see, God changed his name from Abram to Abraham. As for Sarai, thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. See, Abraham had a son with his handmaid, Sarah's handmaid, Hagar, who was the uh, he was the father of a guy, a guy named Ishmael. But God's saying, nope, Ishmael ain't going to be the, the, your, your, your chosen. No, that's no, forget it. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is an hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? And Abraham said unto God, O oh, that Ishmael might live before me, before thee. And God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed. In other words, oh, you don't believe me? You, you laugh in your heart, you think it's a joke? No, no, it's going to happen, Abraham. You better believe it. And God said, Sarah, thy wife, shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him. Not with Ishmael. And just for those of you that don't know it, the... Uh, People, the, the Muslims, the Islamic, they claim Ishmael as their father. But here, God says, nope, I'm not making my covenant with Ishmael. I'm making my covenant with Isaac. So that's why the Muslims, the Islamics, follow the Quran. Because they say, nope, the Bible's wrong. Both Old Testament and New Testament, all wrong. We got to follow Muhammad because he got the thing from, from Gabriel, from some angel named Gabriel. I don't think, you know, you know, the, the Old Testament or New Testament was all wrong, so we're going to have the Quran. That is their line of reasoning. And they'll tell you, oh, well, we, 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 uh, they'll tell you, well, we believe the Bible, but then when you press them, about this, they'll say, oh, well, this is wrong. And they will tell you that Abraham didn't take Isaac to go sacrifice him on the mountain. No, no, they took Ishmael. He took Ishmael. So basically, it's double talk. You know, they'll tell you that they believe it, but then when you press them, they'll say, well, no, it's wrong. Well, why would you believe something that's wrong? And God said, Sarah, Thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant, and with his seed, or children, and with his seed after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him, and will make him fruitful, and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. Now think about this. 
if Ishmael is the father of the Arabs, why are there hundreds of millions of Arabs? Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget and I will make him a great nation. Okay. Well, if if the Jews are all of, of, of Abraham, why are there just a paltry 12 or 15 million Jews in the world? And yet there's hundreds, I mean, I'm sorry, and yet there's hundreds of millions of of Arabs. Did God fail in his promise to uh, the Jews? Or are we looking at the wrong people for the descendants of Abraham? That's something to ask your pastor in a, well, not your pastor, ask it in a Bible study. And then uh, at the end of the Bible study, when you've pointed this out, uh, don't be surprised when you're told to never come back because they know they can't answer the question honestly. God said, but my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. And he left off talking with him and God went up from Abraham. All right, so God made his covenant with Abraham and then with Isaac. And then Isaac had two children, Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, and Esau, which the black Hebrews want to think that's us white people. And if you want a little bit of proof on that, well, let's take a look. We'll go back and take a look. Oh, uh, let's see, in Genesis 25 and verse 26. And after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel. And his name was called Jacob, and Isaac was three score years old when she bare them. And if you don't believe me, you can read Genesis 25 on your own. All right, so... In Genesis 32, verse 9, And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham, and God of my father Isaac, the Lord which saidest unto me, Return unto thy country and to thy kindred, and I will deal well with thee. All right, let's take a look at Genesis chapter 32. We're going to start in verse 24. Jacob wrestles with a man or an angel. We'll see here. And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince thou hast power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. So here, Jacob's name is changed to Israel. So Abraham had Isaac, Isaac had Jacob, Jacob's names changed to Israel, Jacob had 12 sons who became the 12 tribes. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou asked, dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. So evidently, 
I, personally, I believe that uh, Jacob was wrestling with uh, pre-incarnated Christ. That, that's my opinion. I, I could be wrong, but that's just my opinion. All right, so God blessed Abraham, blessed Isaac, blessed A uh, Jacob Israel, who had 12 tribes. The vineyard is Israel, people. Isaiah 5, verse 7. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression. For righteousness, but behold, a cry. All right, let's go to the New Testament. Cha let's see, Matthew chapter 20. We're going to start in verse 1. You know what's interesting is uh, that uh, a lot of these things make a lot of sense when you realize that God's talking about Israel, his vineyard. All right, Jesus speaking a parable. For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers, into his vineyard. Ah. For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder that went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. Now, a penny is not what a penny is today. Uh, I'm old enough to remember when I was a child, uh, three Tootsie Rolls for a penny. Big ones. Three Tootsie Rolls for a penny. We used to collect bottles, uh, soda bottles, Coke, Pepsi. And we'd get two pennies or three pennies. We'd find a bottle on the side of the road. Somebody bought a Coke and threw it out. And, you know, if the bottle didn't break, we'd turn it in, get two or three cents, and uh, buy some Tootsie Rolls. It was great. You know, had to be an enterprising young kids. So a penny back in these days was a day's wage for an unskilled laborer. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. Yeah, God's sending laborers into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. Again he went out about the sixth hour and ninth hour, the sixth and ninth hour, and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle, and saying unto them, Why stand, here, stand ye here all the day idle? They said unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. So when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, Call the laborers, and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more, and they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against, murmured, murmured against the good man of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and the heat of the day. In other words, this is how I look at it somebody that's been a Christian from their youth and done Christian ministry virtually their whole life. And then you got some guy that got saved, you know, maybe a year or two before he died. They're going to get the same. They're going to get the same eternal life. Right? Look at the thief on the cross. He said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, I, you know, I'm paraphrasing. 
He says, this day shalt thou be with me in paradise. The thief on the cross. You know, I, I would be very careful about deathbed confessions and conversions. You know, I've talked to people, said, well, I'm going to live my life and have fun, and then just before I'll die, I'll come to Christ. Uh, maybe you will. Maybe you won't. Maybe the door will slam in your face. The Lord says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. When the door is being knocked, when the Lord's knocking on the door, that's when you answer it. You don't say, Ah, come back later. I'm busy. I'm in the shower. I'm having fun with my uh, girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever. Uh uh. I don't think so. And when they received it, they murmured against the good man of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. And he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst not thou agree with me for a penny? In other words, you know, when I hired you, you, you said, Well, you'll work, work for me for a penny a day. Didn't you agree to that? Take that thine is and go thy way. I will give unto this last even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil because I am good? So the last shall be first, and the first last. For many be called, but few chosen. You want to know something? Well, let's go take a look at Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 8. All right, let's go take a look at Jeremiah chapter 3. Let's look at verse 1. Now remember, keep this in mind, the judgment of of God for disobedience and the blessings of God for obedience. You know, God was God was married to Israel and Judah, who are not the same people. All of Judah is a tri uh, part of Israel, but not all of Israel is part of Judah. I and mean, I've said that so many times, but it just doesn't sink in with most people. You know, Judah was only one of the twelve tribes. You know, there's 50 states in the United States. You got California, you got Texas, Florida, New York, Illinois. Well, all people of California are Americans. Well, maybe back in the old days they were, but now a lot of illegals. But, uh, you know, everybody, uh, all the... Citizens of California who were born are, were Americans, but all not all Americans were from, you know, Californians. So, Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 1. They say, if a man put away his wife and she go from him and become another man's, shall he return unto her again? Shall he return unto her again? You know, you, you got a wife, you divorce her, she goes to be with somebody else, and then she comes back to you. That was a big no-no. If a man put away his wife, divorce, right? Put away, divorce. And she go from him and become another man's, shall he return unto her again? Shall not that land be greatly polluted? But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers. Yet return again to me, saith the Lord. See, God was married to Israel and Judah. Now, people, a lot of people don't get it, but that's what the marriage supper of the Lamb is all about. We're getting ready to read it right here in Jeremiah 3 and verse 8. It's the remarriage of God with Israel. Verse 2. Lift up thine eyes unto the high places, and see where... Thou hast not been lean with. In other words, they were 
laying down with all their many lovers in the high places. In the ways hast thou sat for them as the Arabian in the wilderness, and thou hast polluted the land with thy whoredoms, whoredoms, and with thy wickedness. Therefore the showers have been withholden, and there hath been no latter rain, and thou hadst a whore's forehead. I have no idea what a whore's forehead is. Thou refusest to be ashamed. You know what? You take somebody that's innocent and they do something, they'll be ashamed. But you know, you live a lifetime of sin, they're not even ashamed anymore. Verse 4. Wilt thou not from this time cry to me? My father, thou art the guide of my youth. Will he reserve his anger forever? Will he keep it to the end? Behold, thou hast spoken and done evil things as thou couldest. The Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king. Now, Josiah was, the, to my knowledge, was the last good king of Judah. I, I look forward to meeting him one day, and I hope, I hope he wants to make me a friend. The Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She has gone up upon every high mountain and under every green tree, and there hath played the harlot. Harlot is an archaic old English word. It means a whore. You know, people would go to the high mountains and under the green trees, that's what the witches do. The tr witches love doing their little things under the trees. They even call them sacred oak trees. What's sacred about an oak tree in the Bible? Nothing. And they want to be on the mountains because they want to be close to heaven. But it doesn't work that way. Verse 7. And I said, after... She had done all these things. Who? Israel. And I said after she had done all these things, turn thou unto me, but she returned not. And her treacherous sister Judah saw it. See, Judah was the treacherous sister of Israel. They're not the same. When your pastor tells you Israel and Judah is the same, they're liars either in ignorance or cunning liars. Verse 8. And I saw, when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. God divorced Israel. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. See, God made an everlasting covenant with David, the king, who was of the tribe of Judah, which is where Christ came. His, that was his line. God divorced Israel, but not Judah for that reason. That's what the marriage supper of the Lamb's going to be. God's going to remarry Israel. Her husband died. And he was resurrected. Christ. Didn't Christ hang on the cross and die? Yes, he did. At least his body died. And it came to pass through the lightness of her whoredom that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and with stocks. And yet for all this, her treacherous sister Judah hath not turned unto me with her whole heart, but feignedly, saith the Lord. You know what feignedly means? It means going through the motions, which is what the Pharisees did. The Pharisees were the Jews. They, they, they pretended. They went through the motions. Jesus called them over and over and over hypocrites. 
Don't believe me? Read the book of John. Verse 11. And the Lord said unto me, The backsliding Israel, who God divorced, by the way, the backsliding Israel hath justified herself more than treacherous Judah. Huh. God divorced Israel, but Judah was even worse than Israel was. Verse 12. Now, this is important. We're getting ready to go back to uh, Matthew. We're getting ready to go back to Matthew. Go and proclaim these words toward the north. Well, that's where Israel was. Israel was north of Judah and Jerusalem. Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return thou, backsliding Israel, saith the Lord, and I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you. For I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. Only acknowledge thine iniquity, your wickedness, people. Only acknowledge thine iniquity that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God, and hast scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree, and ye have not obeyed my voice, saith the Lord. Turn, O backsliding children, O backsliding children, saith the Lord. For I am married unto you. I am married unto you. And I will take you, one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. People, when Christ finally decides to come back, when the Father, God the Father sends the Son, that's going to happen. We're going to be brought back to Zion. Verse 15. And I will give you pastors, not, not a pasture like a cow or a sheep would graze in. Pastors like the head of a church, a preacher, and I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. Now, I wouldn't be counting on seeing any of the TBN crowd. Verse 16. And it shall come to pass when ye be multiplied and increased in the land in those days, saith the Lord, they shall say no more the ark of the covenant of the Lord. Neither shall it come to mind, neither shall they remember it, neither shall they visit it, neither shall that be done anymore. anymore. At the time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord. Yeah, not what this garbage is over in Jerusalem today with their gay pride parades, their gay pride events. At that time, they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all the nations shall be gathered unto it. To the name of the Lord to Jerusalem, neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. Now remember, God divorced Israel, but not Judah. Remember that. Verse 18. In those days, the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel. And they shall come together out of the land of the north to the land that I have given for an inheritance unto your fathers. Okay. Well, Israel dwelled in the land that God had given to, their, to the fathers. So... What land to the north could they be talking about here? Take a look at Israel on a map, the land. What's north? Europe. The country and the people who translated the Bible into common languages. The people who built the churches. The people, people who printed the Bibles. The people who sent missionaries all over the world. Europe.
In those days, the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel, and they shall come together out of the land of the north to the land that I have given for an inheritance unto your fathers. But I said, How shall I put thee among the children and give thee a pleasant land, a goodly heritage of the hosts of nations? And I said, Thou shalt call me my father, and shalt not turn away from me. Surely, as a wife treacherously departeth from her husband, so have ye dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. A voice was heard upon the high places, weeping and supplications for the children of Israel, for they have perverted their way, and they have forgotten the Lord their God. Boy, that could not be truer than back then than it is today. The people of Europe have forgotten the Lord their God. But there's good news, verse 22. Return, ye backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. Behold, we come unto thee, for thou art the Lord our God. Truly in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills and from the multitude of mountains. You're not going to find salvation in hills and mountains, no. Truly in the Lord, our God is the salvation of Israel. For shame hath devoured the labor of our fathers from our youth, their flocks and their herds, their sons and their daughters. We lie down in our shame, and our confusion covereth us. For we have sinned against the Lord our God, we and our fathers, from our youth even unto this day, and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord, our God. All right, let's go back to Matthew chapter 20, verse 13. So here it is, the guy hired these people for the vineyard. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst not thou agree with me for a penny? Take that thine is and go thy way. I will give unto this last even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil because I am good? So the last shall be first. Who was last? Who came last? Who's going according to what we just read in Jeremiah? Who's going to come last? Israel is. God divorced Israel. But they're going to come back to the Lord. So the last shall be first, and the first last. For many be called, but few chosen. All right, let's take a look at Luke chapter 15 and verse 11. Jesus speaking. And he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divideth unto them his living. In other words, he's saying, ah, give me, give me my inheritance. So the father says, okay, here you go. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. Eat, drink, and be merry. That's what he did. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And that's what you call humility, people. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. 
And the son said unto him, These are the words the Lord loves to hear the most. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Now his elder son was in the field. So think about this. The youngest went out to live like a whore, a whoremonger, probably got drunk, played around. And here it is, the oldest son, he's out in the field working. He's always, he's always been together working with his father out in the field. He was the first. The prodigal was last. Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. Safe and sound. You didn't know that was a Bible expression, did you? And he was angry. Oh, the, 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 the boy that had stayed with his father and worked hard. And he was angry and would not go in. But therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said unto his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou hast never gave, gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son is come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, you've rewarded this, this whoremonger, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. You see, people, the older son was Judah, true Judah, and the younger son was Israel. Think about it. Think about it. All right, turn to Matthew chapter 21. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, and there came to Bethphage unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway ye shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of these, and straightway he will send them. All this was done that, might, that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Sion, Behold, the king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the foal of an ass." the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them and brought the ass and the colt and put on them their clothes and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before them and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. They're saying blessings of praises, people. And when, he, and when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple. 
and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. What would Jesus do? Uh, throwing over, throwing the tables of the money changers? I love it. Who are the money changers today? Take a look at your local bank. And he said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. And when the chief priests, these are not Catholic priests, these are the Jewish priests, and when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased. Oh, they made the poor Jews unhappy. And said unto him, so the Jews are telling Jesus this, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus saith unto them, Yea, have ye never read? Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise. And he left them and went out of the city into Bethany, and he lodged there. Now in the morning, as he returned into the city, he hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only, and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. We're going to go back to this before I, when I finish this series. This is a very important prophecy. Just remember, the fig tree was a symbol of Judah. So Jesus looked on the fig tree, found no fruit on it. No fruit. Only leaves. And said unto it, Let no fruit grow forth on thee, henceforward forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. Remember that the next time you hear about a Messianic Jew. Think about this. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things, whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. And when he was coming to the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? And Jesus answered and said unto them, I also will ask you one thing, which, if ye tell me, I in like wise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, whence was it? From heaven or of men? And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, Why did ye not then believe him? But if we shall say of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. And they answered Jesus and said, We cannot tell. And he said unto them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. All right. So Jesus in verse 28 is talking to these, these Jewish leaders. So he said, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. But what think ye? A certain man had two sons. And he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. 
And he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. So here it is. You got two kids, right? The one says, oh, I'm not going to go work in the vineyard. Forget about it. But then he thinks about it and he says, ah, you know, dad's been good to me. I, I, I guess I'm going to go work in the vineyard. But then the other one says, oh, okay, I'm going to go, dad, into your vineyard. I'll work. But then later he doesn't go. You know, he says he's going to go and he doesn't do it. The other one says, I'm not going to do it, but he does. And he came to the second and said, likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Jesus asked them, whither of them twain did the will of his father? They said unto him, the first. Jesus saith unto them, verily I say unto you, that the publicans, the tax collectors, that the publicans and the harlots, the whores, the prostitutes, Verily I say unto you that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came not unto you in the way of righteousness. I'm sorry, for John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him, and ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward that ye might believe him. Here, another parable. Now, here's the important one. Isn't this what we read in the book of Isaiah in the beginning? Here, another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. What's a husbandman? That's the guy that takes care of the vineyard. So, the householder planted the vineyard, hedged it, digged a wine press, built a tower, and then and then um, rented it out to the husbandman. And then he went to a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandman that they might receive the fruits of it. Okay? And the husbandman took his servants and beat one and killed another, and stoned another. Again he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him. And let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. When the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? So what do the Jews say? Verse 41. They say unto them, they say unto him, he will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you. The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Ooh. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. And when the chief priests and the Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him.
for a profit. Oh yeah. There's a whole lot of spiritual truth in that parable. Isn't that exactly what we read in the book of Isaiah in the beginning? It is. And you better believe these Jews that knew the book of Isaiah knew exactly what Jesus was talking about. You know, the the, the vineyard, the, the wine press, the tower. Oh, yeah. All right. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus gave a warning to his people. Verse 18. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. See, very important. Remember, Jesus asked the Pharisees, the Jews, uh, why they didn't believe John the Baptist? You know, by what authority doest thou these things? Well, let's take a look at Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, repent. And there's people today that'll tell you that you don't need to repent. Just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let me tell you something. When you read the book of James chapter 1 and verse chapters 2, even Satan believes in God. But John said, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What does it mean to repent? Well, they'll try to confuse you and make you think that, you know, God repents and mankind repents. And then they try to make you think it means the same thing. No, because you're not God. I'm not God. God changes his mind. God's not doing evil that he needs to repent of to turn away from. God's going to bring judgment if the people turn away from their wickedness. That's when he repents. Us, we are born into sin and wickedness. We need to turn away from our sin. Not that we're going to be reach holy, sinless perfection in this world. I don't think it'll ever happen. But... In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then came out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Confessing their sins. They're telling, oh, I slept with that married woman. Oh, I stole from my boss. I lied and cheated. I did this. You know, it's not... When you're confessing your sins you're not bragging you're saying i've done wrong and i'll i i'll never do it again that's what that's what it's repentance is all about it's not a bragging session oh yeah i did my neighbor's wife three times last week oh yeah you should see her she's hot you know that's 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 not repentance that's not confessing your sins that's bragging that's what guys do in the locker room. And girls do it too. Don't tell me they don't. I've worked, I've worked with girls. I know how they I know how they can talk. 
I've overheard them. I had good ears. And were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees, these are two different denominations of Jews. Pharisees are Jews and Sadducees were Jews. And if you don't know what a modern-day Pharisee is, a modern-day Pharisee is every Jew that believes in the Talmud, which is the oral commentary on the law, T-A-L-M-U-D. It came from Babylon. Matter of fact, go to Amazon, the bookseller, and type in Babylonian Talmud, T-A-L-M-U-D, and you will find the commentary, oral commentary, where the rabbis interpret and explain their version of, of, of what they call the oral law. And when he, John the Baptist, saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees, the Jews, come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers. What's a viper? It's a snake. O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, their works. Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid under the root of the trees. Therefore every tree with, which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. Now remember we were talking about the husbandmen that killed, that beat the servants, that stoned the servants, that killed the servants? Well, who are they talking about? Well, that answer is found in the book of Thessalonians, chapter 2. Verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye have received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye have also suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets. You see, the servants that God sent to the vineyard were his prophets. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins alway, for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. All right, let's go to John chapter 10, verse 22. And it was at Jerusalem, the feast of the dedication, and it was winter. Hanukkah. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then came the Jews round about him. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, 
how long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice. Do you hear, when you, do you, when you read the Bible and you read the words of Christ, do you hear his voice? My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I will give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you for my father. For which of those works do ye stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, because and because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. You think the Jews didn't understand? Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I said, Ye are gods? If he called them gods, unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, Thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God? If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though ye believe not me, Believe the works that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Therefore they sought again to take him, but he escaped out of their hand. All right, let's go to Galatians chapter 3, verse 22. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin. Well, all doesn't always mean all. But the Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But the Bible also says, Christ was tempted in all ways like we are, yet without sin. Christ had no sin. If Christ sinned, we have no Savior. And we're looking for another. Just remember that. I, I know people look at that and they say, All means all. Well, the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Did, did Jesus come short of the glory of God? Absolutely not. Christ never sinned. It says, Christ was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. So, just remember, sometimes all does not always mean all. Please remember that. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. You know why the virgin birth happened? So that God so that Christ wouldn't be tainted with sin? That's why the virgin birth happened. Verse 23 But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster, which is the law. So when you hear Hebrew roots people and Torah keepers and Messianic Jews want to bring you back under the law, what does that do to faith? Nothing. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. What did we just read in verse 24? Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. That doesn't give you an excuse to go out and murder people. Okay? Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. But after that, faith has come. We are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as 
have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed, or children, and heirs according to the promise. Remember in the beginning of this study, God made his covenant with Abraham, confirmed it with Isaac, reconfirmed it with Jacob and the 12 tribes? Yeah. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. It doesn't say anything there about spiritual seed. When you show this to a, a church Bible study, they'll say, oh, it's a spiritual seed. No, it's not. No, it's not. All right, let's go to Ma Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Why? Because the first one was polluted. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. On the cross, Jesus said, It is finished. What was finished? The sacrifice. But here he's saying, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega. Alpha was the first letter of the Greek alphabet. That's where it comes from. Alpha, beta, alpha, bet. Omega was the last letter of the Greek alphabet. So Jesus is basically saying, I am the A to Z, not the al al Aleph Tav. Contrary to what the Hebrew roots people try to shove down our throats. Matter of fact, in the book of Titus, we're, uh, we're told... Well, let's read it real quick. In the book of Titus, Paul writes the following in verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 12 and 15. One of, their, one of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow belly. This witness is true. Wherefore rebuke them soundly, I'm, therefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables. In other words, don't listen. When the Jews start telling you stories, it says, don't give heed to Jewish fables. Don't listen to them. Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Unto the pure, all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. So when they tell you, oh yeah, the uh, Alatov, no. The New Testament was written in Greek. And he said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. When Christ died on the cross and they pierced his side, what came out? Blood and water, people. Blood to wash us from our sins and the water of life. Think about it. And I will give unto him that is a thirst the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh 
shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and those that believe in Harry Potter. Oh, no, that's that's the Bob version. And murderers and whoremongers and saucers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake of in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And there came unto me one of the seven angels which hath the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. That's Israel, people. That's Israel. Don't believe it? And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem. There's a difference between earthly Jerusalem and heavenly holy Jerusalem, people. Big difference. Big difference. The holy Jerusalem doesn't have gay pride parades every year. And he carried me away in the spirit to a high, to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Having the glory of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And had a great wall, uh, oh, I'm sorry, and had a wall great and high and had 12 gates. How many tribes of Israel? Twelve. And had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and the names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. But, uh, but, 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 Bob, I was always told that I'm a Gentile, that, that I'm not, I'm not of Israel. Well, ask your pastor, how are, how are we, if we're Gentiles that are not Israel, how are we supposed to get in? There's only 12 gates, and each one's for one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Where's the 13th Gentile gate? Oh, wait a minute, maybe we're supposed to sneak underneath the, the wall somewhere. Uh, I, I, I don't know, how does, how does this work, people? And had a wall great and high and had 12 gates and at the gates 12 angels and names written thereon which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel on the east three gates on the north three gates on the south three gates and on the west three gates and the wall of the city had 12 foundations and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the lamb you see, people, that's, there's only 12 gates. Let's skip down to verse 22. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it. And the Lamb, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor unto it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it, and there shall in no wise enter, in and enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Make sure your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. So, who is Israel? Very important question. And if you're not Israel, well, if you're not one of the 12 tribes, I don't know how you're going to get into the New Jerusalem. So, what can I tell you, people? So this is the conclusion of Fig, Mystery of the Fig Tree, Chapter 3. Yeah, I know. I did the vineyard, the grapes, the fruit. It all ties in together. 
So, 